So Tulsi Gabbard is suing Hillary Clinton for defamation because Hillary Clinton referred to Tulsi Gabbard as a Russian asset. Apparently when asked what she thought about being sued by Tulsi Gabbard, Hillary Clinton responded, Ugh. That's such a Russian asset thing to do. Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and yes, I'm joking, Hillary Clinton did not say that, that was a joke. What's not a joke, however, is that Tulsi Gabbard is in fact suing Hillary Clinton for defamation for having referred to her as a Russian asset a few months ago. Now I can tell you that as a lawyer, there are a few things that lawyers hate more than being wrong, one of which is being wrong on the internet. The flip side to that is I can tell you that lawyers love nothing more than being right, and one thing they love more than that is being right on the internet. When this news broke of Hillary Clinton doing this podcast wherein she referred to Tulsi Gabbard as a Russian asset, I immediately did a vlog on the subject as to whether or not Tulsi Gabbard could sue Hillary Clinton for defamation. In today's political climate, can there be any more of a defamatory accusation than being called the R word? Russian asset. The premise of that vlog being that in today's political day and age, especially in the context of an election cycle, there are few things more damaging than being called a Russian asset. So when Hillary Clinton referred to Tulsi Gabbard as a Russian asset in the context of Tulsi Gabbard's run for the presidential nomination for the Democratic Party, my first thoughts went to a lawsuit in defamation. And I did a vlog where we talked about the principles of defamation, how they are different standards when it applies to a public figure versus a private figure. Actual malice as a criteria for public figures or limited purpose public figures to succeed on a claim of defamation did not exist in the Constitution, and it was the courts that created it in New York Times versus Sullivan. In that vlog, I also addressed some of the weaknesses that would be inherent to Tulsi Gabbard's position if she ever decided to sue for defamation, in that Hillary Clinton didn't actually refer to Tulsi Gabbard specifically by name in the context of the podcast. And as relates to Tulsi Gabbard, it's even more complicated because Hillary Clinton never mentioned her by name. So it's not clear that it could be defamatory as relates to Tulsi Gabbard because she was not specifically mentioned. And recall from my video discussing the dismissal of Nicholas Salmon's lawsuit against the Washington Post, this was in fact part of the reasoning of the judge, that the allegedly defamatory articles didn't actually mention Nicholas Salmon by name and they were therefore not of and about Nicholas Salmon. But while Hillary Clinton did not specifically refer to Tulsi Gabbard by name when she referred to someone as a Russian asset, her spokesperson the next day confirmed any doubt that may have existed. Indeed, when Hillary Clinton's official spokesperson was asked whether or not Clinton was referring to Tulsi Gabbard, the spokesperson allegedly responded, if the nesting doll fits. Nesting dolls or babushka dolls, those are the Russian dolls, you know, the ones where the smaller one fits inside the bigger one and you have like 10 inside one big one. Long story short, Hillary Clinton's spokesperson confirmed that Hillary Clinton was talking about Tulsi Gabbard. I did that vlog three months ago, and I see on Twitter today that the Tulsi Gabbard campaign is suing Clinton for defamation. And that is an insta-vlog if there has ever been an insta-vlog. Such an insta-vlog that I'm actually shooting this vlog in a two-hour window that I have open in between two meetings today. I read the lawsuit, and while I may disagree with some stylistic aspects of the lawsuit, from a substantive point of view, the lawsuit is spectacular. It's spectacular because it proactively preempts what you know are going to be Clinton's defenses in this lawsuit. And when you steal someone's defenses, you literally disarm them. Tulsi Gabbard's lawsuit so proactively anticipates and responds to what you know are going to be the Hillary Clinton defenses that I like to think that Tulsi Gabbard actually saw my vlog and incorporated my advice in that vlog into the drafting of these proceedings. But don't take my word for it. Let's walk through the lawsuit right... Now, all right, here we have the cover page, United States District Court, Southern District of New York, Tulsi Gabbard and Tulsi Now Inc, Plaintiffs versus Hillary Rodham Clinton. And we have the standard summary intro paragraph, Plaintiffs Tulsi Gabbard and Tulsi Gabbard Now Inc bring this lawsuit against defendant Hillary Rodham Clinton for defamation. Tulsi Gabbard is running for president of the United States, a position Clinton has long coveted, but has not been able to attain. By the way, this lawsuit is full of these types of personal jabs. This is not just a lawsuit, this is personal. In October 2019, whether out of personal animus, political enmity, or fear of real change within a political party Clinton and her allies have long dominated, Clinton lied about her perceived rival Tulsi Gabbard. She did so publicly, unambiguously, and with obvious malicious intent. Tulsi has been harmed by Clinton's lies and American democracy has suffered as well. With this action, Tulsi seeks to hold Clinton and the political elites who enable her accountable for distorting the truth in the middle of a critical presidency election. And when I say that I disagree with the lawsuit stylistically, it's because I wouldn't necessarily make it quite so personal. The bottom line is that there is no other defendant other than Hillary Clinton to this lawsuit. So Tulsi Gabbard saying that she's going to hold the political elite responsible, it sounds a little lofty. Regardless, these are stylistic details on the substance of the lawsuit. It is extremely well drafted. Nature of the case. Tulsi Gabbard has lived her life with one guiding principle, putting the needs of others before her own. That's why she joined the Army National Guard. That's why she campaigned for and was elected to the United States House of Representatives and that is why she is right
running for president. Living by this principle, Tulsi has put the country's needs above all else, even when it means hurting her political career. For example, in February 2016, Tulsi believed that the best Democratic presidential candidate for our country was Senator Bernie Sanders. She also knew that Clinton had a stranglehold over the Democratic Party and that crossing Clinton, who considered herself to be the inevitable nominee, could mean the end of her own political career. Yet Tulsi put the country before herself and she publicly endorsed Senator Sanders becoming the most prominent politician to do so at the time. And here I can just imagine Bernie Sanders sipping his morning cup of coffee saying thank you very much Tulsi Gabbard for the free advertising. And here Tulsi Gabbard is laying the foundation for why Hillary Clinton might have a vendetta against Tulsi Gabbard, in particular to support the allegations of actual malice as relates to the defamation as we will see later on in this lawsuit. Clinton, a cutthroat politician by any account. Let me just pause right here to say that some might consider that allegation itself to be defamatory. In my humble opinion, calling someone cutthroat is not a statement of fact, but rather a statement of opinion. Also, being called a cutthroat politician might not be an insult to everybody. It might actually be a compliment to some politicians. Clinton, a cutthroat politician by any account, has never forgotten this perceived slight. And in October 2019, she sought retribution by lying publicly and loudly about Tulsi Gabbard. Specifically, in widely disseminated national comments, Clinton falsely stated that Tulsi, an Army National Guard officer and United States Congresswoman who has spent her entire adult life serving this country, is a Russian asset. Clinton's false assertions were made in a deliberate attempt to derail Tulsi's presidential campaign. Clinton had no basis for making her false assertions about Tulsi, and indeed, there is no factual basis for Clinton's conspiracy theory. Clinton peddling of this theory has harmed Tulsi, has harmed American voters, and has harmed American democracy. Tulsi brings this lawsuit to ensure that the truth prevails and to ensure this country's political elites are held accountable for intentionally trying to distort the truth in the midst of a critical presidential election. And then we have a description of the parties, which you can go read yourself. I'm going to post a link to the judgment in the pinned comment below. Just to stop at paragraph six. Tulsi Now Inc. is the principal campaign committee for Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Now is incorporated in Delaware with its principal place of business in Hawaii. For the purposes of Tulsi Gabbard's presidential campaign, Tulsi Gabbard and Tulsi Now are essentially synonymous and operate in sync. Gabbard cannot run for office without Tulsi Now, and Tulsi Now is the entity required for receiving, processing, and handling all contributions to her presidential campaign. So I did another vlog on Tulsi Gabbard's lawsuit against Google. If you haven't seen that video, I'm going to post it right here. Give it a watch. In the comment section to that video, people were asking why Tulsi Now Inc. is the plaintiff. What legal interest would Tulsi Now Inc. even have? Well, paragraph six alleges why Tulsi Gabbard is including Tulsi Now Inc. as a plaintiff. It's also entirely plausible that Tulsi Now Inc. has indeed suffered damages as a result of the alleged defamation, in which case they would have a legal interest to be a plaintiff to the suit. And from a strategic point of view, others rightly pointed out that this might allow Tulsi Now Inc. to assume the costs of the lawsuit. In other words, it wouldn't be Tulsi Gabbard personally as the sole plaintiff carrying the costs of these lawsuits. Now that Tulsi Now Inc. is a plaintiff, Tulsi Now Inc. can assume the legal costs, which presumably means that these legal costs could be legitimate campaign expenses and be paid for through campaign donations. I am by no means certain about this. If anybody knows the answer to the question, post it in the comment section below and hopefully that answer will rise to the top. Then we've got the jurisdiction allegations that New York is the proper jurisdiction because that is the place of domicile of the defendant. The court has jurisdiction because the amount of the controversy exceeds $75,000. And then we get into the factual allegations. We're going to skip through these quickly. Tulsi is a four-term United States Congresswoman. Tulsi's presidential campaign is the culmination of a long career of public service. As a child, Tulsi's parents would enlist her and her siblings in service days where the family would pick up litter from beaches or prepare food for homeless families. Paragraph 16. Clinton was the 2016 Democratic Party nominee for President of the United States. The United States Secretary of State from 2009 to 2013. A United States Senator for the State of New York from 2001 to 2009. And the First Lady of the United States from 1993 to 2001. Clinton also ran for president in 2008, but she failed to secure the Democratic Party nomination. And here's where it gets in both the 2008 and the 2016 presidential elections, Clinton was the clear frontrunner, but she ultimately lost in surprise upsets. First to President Barack Obama in the 2008 presidential primary, then to President Donald Trump in the 2016 presidential election. Having dealt with lawyers for the better part of my professional life, I can tell you that this was drafted deliberately to be a jab. All right, but all of this is the lead up to the substance of the lawsuit. On October 17, 2019, Clinton was a guest on the podcast Campaign HQ with David Plouffe. Sorry, and just to open up a totally irrelevant parenthesis here, Plouffe is a last name of French origins, and in French, Plouffe is an onomatopoeia for the sound of dropping something into water. In the course of a widely distributed national interview, Clinton stated the following regarding, quote, somebody who is currently in the Democratic Party, who they are grooming to be third party candidate. She's the favorite of the Russians. They have a bunch of sites and bots and other ways of supporting her so far. And that's assuming Jill Stein will give it up, which she might not because she's also a Russian asset. Yeah, she's a Russian asset. Paragraph 18, Campaign HQ with David Plouffe is a popular and prominent political podcast. The podcast is hosted by David Plouffe, President Barack Obama's former campaign manager. Campaign HQ with David Plouffe has 
a large audience and is available for streaming through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio.com, and Player FM, amongst other places. The podcast is produced and hosted by Cadence 13, a company valued around $50 million. Paragraph 19. The next day, October 18, Clinton doubled down on the defamatory statements. A CNN reporter asked Clinton's official spokesperson, Nick Merrill, whether the defamatory statements were about Tulsi. Clinton's spokesman responded, if the nesting doll fits. This is not some outlandish claim. This is reality. Paragraph 20. Clinton's reference to the nesting doll is a reference to the universally known Russian nesting dolls, matryoshka dolls, or as I know them, babushka dolls. Paragraph 21. Clinton's defamatory statements immediately harmed Tulsi, despite reprobation of Clinton by several 2020 presidential candidates, including Senator Bernie Sanders, Marianne Williamson, and Andrew Yang. For her baseless conspiracy mongering, Clinton's defamatory statements spread like wildfire across the internet and took on a life of their own. Millions of Americans heard or read about a well-known authority figure, Clinton, stating as fact that Tulsi was a Russian asset and the favorite of the Russians. Scientifically conducted opinion surveys have shown that Clinton's false malicious statements about Tulsi were accepted as true by millions of Americans, including large numbers of voters in battleground presidential primary states. In short, Clinton got exactly what she wanted by lying about Tulsi. She harmed her political and personal rivals' reputation and ongoing presidential campaign and started a damaging whisper campaign based on baseless but vicious untruths. And then we have a few paragraphs alleging that Hillary Clinton refused to retract her defamatory statements, notwithstanding multiple requests to that effect by Tulsi Gabbard. And now we get into some serious law. The defamatory statements are false and defamatory per se. Now I've mentioned this in previous vlogs, but a defamatory statement that is defamatory per se is a statement that is defamatory on its face with no need for any extrinsic evidence. The other type of defamatory statements are defamatory per quad, meaning that some sort of extrinsic evidence is necessary to understand why the statement was defamatory. Here the allegation is that being called a Russian asset is defamatory per se, no need for any other evidence, it is defamatory on its face. And I don't think that many politicians would disagree with that. The defamatory statements expressly stated and specifically conveyed that Tulsi, a United States Congresswoman, presidential candidate, and major in the United States Army National Guard, is a, quote, Russian asset. The ordinary and average person who heard and read the defamatory statements understood them to be making serious charges against Tulsi, that Tulsi is a tool of and perhaps an agent of the United States geopolitical rival Russia. The defamatory statements indisputably were made about and concerned Tulsi. This much is clear from the words of Clinton's own official spokesman on October 18, 2019, as well as from innumerable media reports interpreting the defamatory statements as concerning Tulsi. Americans throughout the country interpreted Clinton's defamatory statements exactly as they were intended to be interpreted, as referring to Tulsi and stating the fact that Tulsi was a Russian asset. In my original vlog on this subject, I did mention how there would be an argument as to whether or not what Hillary Clinton said was of and about Tulsi Gabbard. Whether or not you agree with it, Tulsi Gabbard is, at some point in time, going to have to respond to that defense. And what she does off the bat is disarm the defendant by addressing that defense up front, including specific allegations to remove any doubt that the state were of and about Tulsi Gabbard. And the allegation is unequivocal that Hillary Clinton's own official spokesman confirmed that it was about Tulsi Gabbard. We also have an allegation specifying that the statement was a statement of fact and not a statement of opinion. Preempting what you know is going to be another one of the defenses that calling someone a Russian asset really is a matter of opinion and not a statement of fact. Although the fact that Hillary Clinton's official spokesman said the next day that this is not some outlandish theory, this is reality, would eliminate any doubt as to whether or not it was expressed as a sentiment of opinion or a statement of fact. Paragraph 30 the ordinary and average person who heard and read the defamatory statements additionally understood them to be statements of fact because Clinton portrays herself to the public as the flag bearer for ensuring that truth prevails in speech related to politics. As the Democratic Party's presidential nominee in 2016, a former Secretary of State, a former United States Senator, and the former First Lady of the United States, Clinton is widely perceived by the public as someone who would have access to information and intelligence not available to ordinary Americans, and who would therefore know if Tulsi or anyone else were a Russian asset. Not only that, but Clinton has campaigned for stopping false and misleading statements by election campaigns. She portrays herself as a neutral third-party observer. These were not statements by someone who is well-known to speak in hyperbole. Paragraph 32, the defamatory statements are materially false because they would have a different effect on the mind of the listener or reader from that which the truth would have produced. Tulsi is not a Russian asset. No one, Russia or anyone else, controls her or her presidential campaign. Instead, Tulsi is a loyal American servant, declaring her allegiance to the United States of America both as a soldier and as a member of Congress. She has been serving for over 16 years in the United States Army National Guard and has voluntarily deployed twice to war zones in the Middle East. The defamatory statements are defamatory because they tend to lead the average person in the community to form an evil or bad opinion of Tulsi, as well as because they tend to discredit Tulsi in the conduct of her occupation, profession, and office. And now we get into the part of the lawsuit where allegations are made that Hillary Clinton made these defamatory statements with actual malice. 
Why? Well, this is something we've touched on pretty much in every video I've done on defamation. Being a public figure in order to succeed on a claim of defamation, the defamatory statements have to have been made with actual malice. Sullivan versus the New York Times. And this part of the lawsuit I find to be particularly insightful and particularly compelling. As a former United States Senator and Secretary of State, and not just an ordinary American, Clinton had reason to know that the defamatory statements were false. She had no facts backing up her defamatory statements, including her claim that Tulsi was, quote, a Russian asset. In fact, Clinton had access to a surfeit of reliable information to the contrary. For example, no United States law enforcement or intelligence agencies have claimed, much less presented any evidence, that Congresswoman Gabbard is a Russian asset. As a member of the House Armed Services Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, and Homeland Security Committee, and as a major in the United States Army National Guard with access to highly sensitive and classified information, Tulsi has never had her security clearances challenged or revoked. Clinton, a former United States Senator and Secretary of State, certainly knows, and knew at the time she made the defamatory statements, that if Tulsi was truthfully a Russian asset, she would not have been in these positions of great responsibility with access to the most sensitive national security information and working closely with officials at the highest levels in the United States military, including the commander of the United States Pacific Command. Rather than facts or reliable evidence, Clinton's basic for the defamatory statements was one or both of A. Her own imagination or B. Extremely dubious conspiracy theories that any reasonable person, and especially Clinton, a former United States Senator and Secretary of State, would know to be fanciful, wholly unverified, and inherently and objectively unreliable. In view of Clinton's personal and professional history, there is no other reasonable inference but that Clinton, at a minimum, made a deliberate decision not to acquire knowledge of facts that might confirm the probable falsity of the defamatory statements and purposely avoid the truth. But the more likely inference is that Clinton intentionally lied to harm her perceived personal and professional rival, Tulsi. And it's a super interesting series of allegations because what you have basically is Tulsi saying, I'm not just any public figure. I am a high ranking person in the military with access to very sensitive information. The defamatory statements are not coming from some random person from off the street. They are coming from someone who was highly involved in the government, who had access to information that the lay person on the street never had access to. And to that extent, people are gonna give those statements a lot more weight than if someone from off the street had made them. This is high school drama at the national scale. In February 2016, Tulsi was the vice chair of the DNC. She publicly backed Senator Sanders over Clinton for president. And she was the highest profile congressperson to do so at the time. Clinton was extremely angry, to put it mildly, that Tulsi endorsed Senator Sanders over her. Clinton's agents emailed Tulsi to tell her that the Clinton team no longer trust Tulsi's judgment. And Tulsi was told that the Clinton team would never forget this slight. Among other things, Clinton's agents relayed that the Clinton team will refuse to assist Tulsi in any of her campaigns. These agents then forwarded this correspondence to Huma Abedin, Clinton's closest aide, and John Podesta, chairman of Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, to gloat about the beatdown they felt they delivered on Tulsi, writing, hammer dropped. It has been widely reported by news sources that Clinton is known to keep longtime grudges, even going as far as maintaining for me and against me databases, and scoring degrees of treachery for those who have crossed her. So that is the lawsuit, and like I said, it is extremely well drafted in that it preempts the defenses that you know are coming. But what I find most compelling about this entire lawsuit is the essence of the allegation at paragraph 31. The fact that these statements were coming from Hillary Clinton given her role in government, given her access to highly sensitive information she had during her tenure as Secretary of State, not only would people regard these statements as fact, they would regard these statements as like super duper facts. They would regard these statements as like double secret probation facts. These are not statements coming from a shock jock. These are statements coming from a former secretary of state, a former first lady, a former senator. Someone who people might actually think had access to information to support these statements. And my prediction on this lawsuit, I find the position set forward by Tulsi Gabbard to be extremely compelling. They have anticipated and responded to the defenses that you know are coming, and I think they did a good job at it. And I do think the statements are highly damaging to Tulsi Gabbard's reputation, especially as relates to people who might only read the headlines. People who are more fully immersed in politics know the backdrop and they can digest this information a little differently. But there are going to be a great many people who are going to be left with this impression, even if they don't even know why they are left with this impression, to the effect that Tulsi Gabbard is somehow a Russian asset. That somehow she's in the same camp as all of the other politicians who have been accused of being Russian assets. It is objectively damaging, the only question is going to be whether or not it qualifies as defamation given the high standard and burden of proof that befalls public figures. Befalls? I think that's the right word. But can you imagine this going to trial? Can you imagine Hillary Clinton on the witness stand? It would be a media frenzy to say the least. Now, if you like my videos and you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell if you want to get notified when I put up a video, drop a comment in the comment section below to feed the algorithm. If you want to support my channel, there are support links in the pinned comment. You can get some merch. You can support me via PayPal. If you haven't seen my Tulsi Gabbard sues Google lawsuit, I'm gonna link that video right here. Give it a watch. And now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah.